I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can see the scripture passage on page 7 of your bulletin. Uh, we'll be looking this morning at 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 through 8. All of our families have rules. I'll take that now. The evidence of a good deacon. Thank you. All of our families have rules. Some of our rules are understood. Some of them we share verbally. Uh, other rules, uh, some families post. Uh, and so you can buy signs or some makeup signs that they post in their homes. These are our, our family rules. Uh, some of them include things like uh, clean up after yourself, always a good rule and one hard to instill, uh, oftentimes in families. Uh, some have the, the rule of uh, share, no back talking or whining. Uh, there, uh, there is uh, the rule, depending on your household, no yelling, kicking, or hitting. Um, it's probably more for boys than for girls, at least that's what I'm told. Um, and, uh, or the rule, we tell the truth, that that's a value in it and something that's, that's important. The, the church, as we're going to see this morning, is a family. And the household of God has rules as well. Now, in some churches, these are uh, understood. Uh, they're uh, not written down anywhere, but if you break it, you know that you've broken it. Uh, but Paul, in 1 Timothy 5, lays out rules for the household of God. We're beginning a new section in 1 Timothy 5, in which he goes through and describes how various portions of the family are to relate to each other and what their responsibilities are. Uh, this morning we're going to be looking uh, mainly at widows. Uh, how does the church relate to the widows that are within the congregation? Because the gospel is very, very practical. The gospel isn't some theological notion that we just kind of meditate upon and try to understand. The gospel is seen in a church in how we relate to one another. If you want to know, if you're maturing in your Christian life, the evidence of that is how you relate to other believers. Uh, and uh, that, that's the point we're going to see over and over again here in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Uh, and so let me read that text for us. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, verses 1 through 8, this is the word of God. Do not rebuke an older man, but encourage him as you would a father, younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. She who is truly a widow, left all alone, has set her hope on God, and continues in supplications and prayers night and day. But she who is self-indulgent is dead, even while she lives. Command these things as well, so that they may be without reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household. He has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And we'll stop there. Let's pray together. Father, as we come and approach your word today and, and see especially uh, the care that, and love and concern that you have for uh, Christian widows, we, we pray that you would give to us a clarity of understanding about this, that uh, you would grant to us an understanding of, of the application of these things for us individually and as families, as well as a congregation. Uh, open our eyes to your word and use your spirit towards that end, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Excuse me. So as I said just a moment ago, the Bible, over and over again, talks about the, the local church, the local congregation, uh, being a family. That one aspect 
of your salvation is not just that you were justified, that you were born again, but you were adopted. That in Christ you were adopted and brought into a, a new spiritual family in which God is your father. And the blessings of that family have, have become yours. And when you became saved, and particularly when you co- came here to covenant, you were adopted into a new family with new brothers and sisters that you didn't have before. Uh, and this family relationship is, is an important aspect of our salvation and an important aspect of the, the work that God is doing in you. Uh, John talked about this when he was uh, in the very beginning of his gospel when he said, but to all who did receive him, who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Now, we're not a cult. We don't leave our natural families behind. Uh, we don't ignore them, we, uh, but, but we maintain those loving relationships with them. But in, in some sense, the spiritual family that we become part of within the congregation uh, has a greater importance and impact in some ways. Some of you have commented to me how you have found that your spiritual family at Covenant you relate to in, in greater ways because you have a common faith, you, you share common uh, uh, desires and understandings about Jesus and, and about salvation. And it's within the congregation and within the church uh, that we find these, these blessings that come because God has united us together in our faith. One commentator said, uh, we know the familiar phrase, blood is thicker than water. Uh, and he added to that, but the spirit is thicker than blood. Uh, you will spend eternity uh, with your spiritual family. Uh, and uh, it's a great blessing that God has, has given to us. And, and understanding this point helps us have a proper understanding of the church. We are not to be people that see each other once an hour, uh, one hour a week and then move on with our lives and give no thought to each other. Uh, the church ought to be functioning in a way that these familial relationships have meaning to us and these familial relationships uh, impact us and become a a high priority for us uh, as we go along. Now, within the church family, as as well as within our families, uh, our physical families, uh, there's some familiar similarities, I should say. We love each other. That's, That's part of being part of a family. We also recognize that within the church family, just like our physical family, some people are a little harder to get along with than others. We, we recognize that that's, that's an aspect. I uh, think of a great aunt I have uh, who I discovered, I didn't know this as a boy, she, she's, she's gone, uh, she's uh, passed away. She was a real racist. And it was shocking what I would hear come out of her mouth that I, I never heard before. And, and it just, ooh. You, 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 you don't want to hear it. You're not sure you want to be there, but it's family. There, there are people that, tr- that, that trigger us at times, but that's part of being part of the same family. Uh, we recognize that in, in the church family, as well as in our, our, our physical families, there's conflicts that come up. There's conflicts between uh, us and someone else within the family. And we're not surprised by that because... Both of, our, both of our families, whether spiritual or physical, are made up of sinful people. And so we expect these things to happen. The difference is, uh, in the church, uh, we're called to work through those. We're called to reconcile. We're called to ask for forgiveness when, when we've done something uh, and to find restoration uh, in that way. But the point of this, of, of 1 Timothy chapter 5, is knowing we're part of the same family means that we need to treat each other as Christian family members. The way we deal with each other is based on what we know about uh, our family situation uh, and uh, as part of the church. And so Paul, here in, uh, uh, the, in our, on our text, in the first two verses, where he gives some general directions for household rules, deals with four separate groups of people. Now, uh, the first application of this is to Timothy. 
Uh, Timothy is the pastor. He knows he needs to know how to deal with different groups within the congregation. But it's also, remember, this letter is being read to the congregation. And they need to know how to deal with different groups within the congregation as well. And so he starts there in verse 1 uh, to give directions. How do you deal with an older man? Now remember, Timothy is probably about 35. And how do you deal with someone in the congregation uh, that will need at some point uh, some admonishment? How does the young pastor deal with the older man? Paul assumes that's going to happen at some point. There's someone that's going to need to be admonished who's much older than Timothy. And notice that uh, what he says is such a man should not be harshly rebuked, the ESV says, but encouraged. Uh, I, th- I think a, a better, better understanding of that word would be to exhort or to admonish. And the point he makes here is older men within the family ought to be honored and respected. And younger men in the family shouldn't be harshly rebuking them, but should come alongside them and admonish them in a much more gentle way. Uh, that it's not the place for younger people in the church uh, to refrain from showing respect to the fathers of the faith. Uh, in Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 32, uh, it says, You shall stand up before the gray head and honor the face of an old man. Honor and respect is what is, uh, ought to be given to the older members of the congregation Uh, who have lived many more years, experienced much more in the faith, uh, and deserve that kind of respect. And then he goes on to say, well, how are younger men to be treated? Younger men, in verse 1, are to be treated as brothers. This is the opposite problem. Those of you who are older in the church shouldn't look down on younger people uh, and deride them uh, without uh, recognizing that was you at some point. We treat each other uh, with respect. The older towards the younger and the younger towards the older. uh, And recognize that they are our peers. uh, That when uh, someone comes alongside and begins to work with you and serve with you who are older, you recognize that they are peers that God has given to the church and you don't look down upon them uh, because of their youthfulness. And then older women, in verse 2, how do you treat an older woman within the congregation? Like you would on your best day towards your mother. Older women deserve protection and care. They deserve respect as well. They are to be, as we'll see in just a moment, to be special objects of of care and concern within the congregation. Uh, And it's important that... uh, Uh, we show them that honor and respect. And younger women as well, at the very end of the verse, younger women as sisters in all purity, that we recognize that familiar relationship with the younger women. Thinking here particularly about those who are not married, uh, younger unmarried women uh, as uh, as, uh, there to be cared for and, and, and overseen and protected, and adds that phrase, in all purity, Uh, that there would be uh, no hint of sexual immorality uh, in in terms of how uh, we we approach or or deal with these particular people. Um, These are the general rules. This is how the gospel impacts us. This is how we relate to one another because we've been changed. We've been transformed by the gospel. And this is how we look at each other uh, and deal with each other. Now, here's an interesting thing to take note of. He deals with the entire congregation in two verses and then goes on and spends 14 verses dealing with widows. Why would he do that? Why would he spend all the way down to verse 16 is the subject of how do we respond to widows within the congregation? There was something going on in the Ephesian church related to widows that Paul was aware of and was very concerned about. One thing we know from 2 Timothy 3 is that there were some widows who were following false teachers, younger widows 
uh, who were following the false teachers and were creating more trouble for the congregation. So that's one thing that Paul is aware of. It also appears to be the case that the church was supporting more widows than they should have been. Uh, and that seems to be the concern that Paul has here in our text and uh, wants to, to deal with. And so we know from Scripture that the care of widows is something that is seen throughout both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, we, we know, for example, uh, in uh, Deuteronomy 10, verse 18, God said, He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. So there's three groups of people that God says he has particular concern for. There, there is the orphan, there is the widow, and there is the sojourner or the alien. And the widow, the topic here in this text, is seen over and over again being an object of God's concern. This is seen throughout the Old Testament law where God specifies you. You, you can't, when you go to harvest, you can't harvest all the way, all of your fields. You need to leave some for the widow to be able to collect. And, and there are rules about how widows were to be treated because of their special situation. We know that both Elijah and Elisha had a special ministry uh, to widows uh, to care for them who, who had no other provision. Uh, we, we know that in the early church, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 6, the diaconate was formed because there was a concern that widows be cared for because the church recognized that this was something that was important. And James, in James chapter 1, uh, said, What is pure and undefiled religion? Uh, it is to visit wid orphans and widows in their affliction. This is a practical way that we show that we've been impacted by our faith, that we live out our calling as God's people. And so the point that he makes in verse 3 is that true widows are to be honored. He says, honor widows who are truly widows. Now, in one sense, most widows are older women, and they deserve honor and respect because of their age and, and because of their experience in the church. But the honor that's mentioned here is more than just respect. The honor that's mentioned is the idea of providing for their needs, uh, materially, uh, emotionally, coming alongside of them in their time of need, that it's a responsibility of our family to see that our widows are cared for. And that's the point that he makes uh, in verses 3 through 8. But notice the language that's used in verse 3. Uh, who are truly widows. That same language is used again down in verse 5, who's truly a widow, and down again in verse 16, who are truly widows. He's making a point here. There are some widows who are truly widows, he says. These are the widows that deserve the, the support financially and materially from the church. There are other widows that don't need that support. Uh, and he's trying to differentiate between those two groups so that we have a, a clarity and understanding. And so the rest of the text defines for us who are those who are truly widows. And there's two criteria. The first criteria is in verse 4. The, the woman who is truly a widow and, and ought to be supported by the church is one who is truly alone. It says, but if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents, for this is pleasing in the sight of God. Now, there was a huge difference between what widows experienced today, typically, and what widows in the first century experienced. Today, most widows have the benefits of Social Security and uh, Medicare. They may have some pension or something from their husband's pension. Uh, in the first century, uh, there was no government programs. There were no pension programs. Uh, if your husband died and you had no other family, you were left destitute. Uh, and that you were only able to survive 
if someone else came alongside to provide help for you. Now, there was one provision in the first century that would help a widow, and that was the concept of the dowry. When a woman would become married, her father paid a dowry to her husband. This dowry was not meant to be spent on uh, wild vacations and luxuries. It was to be reserved for the sake of his wife. And uh, the dowry then, uh, if the husband died, uh, the one who was to protect the dowry, typically a son, would then take responsibility for his mother. And the dowry would be a financial security for her. If there was no son, a widow in those days would either uh, would then typically go back to her father's home, if her father was still living, and receive that protection and care for her there. That's assuming she had a godly husband who didn't spend the dowry uh, on other things, uh, but had reserved it for this kind of situation. But in, in, in Paul's mind, as he's looking for this, he's, he's saying, whether you have a dowry or not, according to verse 4, the first line of care for a widow is her family. This is where she ought to be going uh, to receive care, and these are the people that ought to be providing that kind of care for her. And so children and grandchildren, in verse 4, are the ones who are first responsible uh, to see that a widow is provided for and cared for. And this is a, an application of the fifth commandment. This is part of what it means to honor your father and your mother, uh, that uh, this honor is due to them uh, while uh, in, in all the circumstances of life. Uh, and one way we honor, uh, whether it's a, a, a widower or a widow, uh, is by caring for them and seeing that the needs they can't care for themselves are being provided. And there's two motivations there in verse 4 as to why families ought to be doing this. The first is to make a return for their parents. He says there, let them first learn to show godliness to their own household and to make some return to their parents. When you're young, you don't have any idea of the kind of return that your parents deserve. As you get older, you'll begin to see and to understand and, and to recognize these things. Uh, this, this woman is the one that went through labor and gave you birth. This is the one who changed your diaper and wiped your nose. This is the one who cared for you and supplied food for you and, and upheld you. This is the one that put up with you in your teenage years when you were hard to put up with. This is the one who never stopped loving you no matter how many times you blew it, no matter how many times you, you were arrogant and spoke wrongly to her, her love didn't change. Widowhood or older years for your parents is an opportunity to return the investment they made in you. It's, it's not a drudgery. It's not this horrible burden that, that's placed upon us but it's an opportunity to show the same love to them that they've shown to us. And this is part of God's plan. The reason he puts us in families and doesn't just make us individuals that, that are out on our own, but this is one way that we show this kind of love and concern. But the second reason that we do this uh, is because at the end of verse 4, it's pleasing in the sight of God. When we care for our older parents, when we care for any family member that's unable to care for themselves, we're showing that we have the same love and concern and values that God does. That we're doing this because we want to emulate God, our Father, who loves us and cares for us. We're being obedient in order to bring glory to God in order to show that like him, we also love those who are particularly in need. Uh, and, and so notice that in verse 8, it says, if you refuse to do this, it's evidence that you're not a believer. It's evidence that you're still dead in your sins. He says there, even pagans know 
that we ought to take care of our parents. Even pagans in the Roman Empire in the first century understood that this was an important thing to do. And for a believer to refuse to care for parents, or at least one who claimed to be a believer, shows that their heart is so hard that the gospel has not yet penetrated and they're still lost in their sins. That's why I say the gospel has application. And we see the application of the gospel when our hearts are doing that which God has commanded us to do, uh, to care for those who are unable to care for themselves. I, I think uh, you, you remember in, uh, in Mark and uh, in one of the other gospels, there is the story of Jesus as he's approaching the gate of Nain, and he sees this woman coming, leading a funeral procession, and it's her son, and the text is very clear, her only son who has died. And he recognizes the horrendous circumstances she's going to be under. No husband to care for her, no son to provide for her, and he stops the funeral, stops the process, and raises the son and gives him back to his mother because of his great concern for her as well as to show his power as the Son of God. That concern is the church's concern as well. We ought to be providing care for those who are truly widows, but families ought to be providing care first. That's the first place to go. And so uh, the, the first example here, uh, or first criteria of, of one who is truly a widow is someone who's truly alone. They have no family who's able to care for them, no family that can provide for them. What's the second criteria? Well, it's down in verses 5 and 6. The widows that ought to be supported by the church are widows who are godly. Now, in verse 6, it gives us an example of those that should not be supported. Uh, those who are self-indulgent, who are dead, even while she lives. Uh, the, the, the language of self-indulgent is the idea of living for pleasure, uh, doing what they desire to do, um, but not having a concern to, to live for the glory of God. And, and within every church, there are, there's a mixture of, of believers and unbelievers, so it's not surprising that there would be someone in the Ephesian church uh, who would be living for themselves, for, uh, for their own pleasure and their own desires. Uh, and, and Paul says, these are not the widows that the church ought to be supporting. Uh, these uh, these self-indulgent ones, according to the end of verse 6, are not even believers. They're dead spiritually, uh, even while they're living physically. Uh, the church should not be supporting those who are even part of the church but are living in ongoing sin uh, and showing no evidence of true faith. Uh, these are probably, it, it, it seems to be apparent uh, that uh, verse 6 is implying there were some that were being supported by the church that were in this condition. And Paul is saying this ought not to be the case. Uh, these are not the ones that the church is called uh, to support in this way. But rather, verse 5, we're to support the widow who's godly. We're to support the one uh, who, is, uh, uh, who set her hope on God. She has trusted in God alone for her salvation. She has learned to trust God more and more through her widowhood. Uh, she struggles at times with her faith, but her faith endures uh, because she's a true believer. Uh, and the uh, result is that her godliness, one example of her godliness at the end of verse 6, is seen in her prayer life. Older, this is a distinction between younger and older widows. Uh, in, the, in the next paragraph, he deals with younger widows and gives them some warnings. But older widows have more time. They're no longer concerned about caring for a husband and, and caring for children and, and all of those responsibilities. Uh, and the example he gives is the godly widow is the one who recognizes this extra time, gives me more time for prayer. And so there have been many widows that I've known uh, who have found that their prayer life has, has increased significantly because in this stage of life that God has given to them, they're able to pray more 
for other people, for their, for their church, for their family, for their friends, for, the, for missions. And they're able to do this because they don't have the regular cares that they used to have. Paul says this is an example of how that godliness is seen. And these are the kinds of widows that the church needs to particularly support and care for uh, and, and see that uh, they are being provided for. Now, this is an interesting situation. The problem in Ephesus does not appear to be that they were stingy and that they weren't, they're unwilling to support the widows of the congregation. The, the, the text would, would indicate that the problem was they were being overly generous. They were supporting women that they should not have been supporting according to the biblical principles. And so Paul's concern is to say, uh, we want to honor widows, we want to support widows, we want to see that they're, they have all the provision that they need, but not every widow in the congregation ought to receive an equal level of support. Uh, they, they need to be widows who are truly alone, their family uh, is un, there is no family to help them, or they need to be uh, widows who have shown themselves to be godly and believers. Uh, in, in living out their faith. Now, there are, there are exceptions, particularly that first principle that they need to be alone. There are situations in which families refuse to support their parents. And in those situations, we rightly come alongside and, and help them and, and seek to provide for them. There are situations in which families are unable to provide for their, their widowed mother or, or widow or father. Uh, and they, they just, you know how expensive it is to live here, uh, and they just don't have the income to be able to do uh, care for two households, and we rightly come alongside and provide help for them. But the family is where uh, we send, uh, we expect first uh, care to come from, and then we supplement and provide for that care as well. This passage according to a book written by Joanne Shetler, uh, had a great impact and was one of the first evidences she saw of the gospel's impact among a group of people in the Philippines. She was sent to translate a Bible for them. And she went to the Philippines, she started working with this group, and she had translated most all of the Bible and saw no real fruit that was taking place. There were people that, that had a general understanding of Jesus and said they loved him, but, but lives weren't showing the impact, the fruit of the gospel in their lives. And then the man that helped her translate 1 Timothy was impacted greatly by the text we're looking at this morning. There was an older widow who lived among the people. Her name was Forson. And she had no husband and no children. All of them had died. In the culture of this particular people group, if you weren't blood, you weren't deserving of help. And so ordinarily, she would go to her hut and she would eventually die of hunger because no one would feel the need to care for her and provide for her. The man who had been doing translation work with her came to this particular passage and was so moved by what God said that he did the extraordinary. And he went to Forsum and said, come, you now are going to live with me. You will be as a mother to me and I will be as a son to you. And it was so extraordinarily different from anything that had happened among this group that it began the process of the gospel impacting that group. And the fruit of her work began to show itself as more and more people understood the meaning of the gospel and the impact of the gospel. That's what the gospel does. The gospel doesn't just give us a theological foundation, but it changes the way we think and the way we act, our values and, and our concerns. The fruit of true faith is seen in how we respond to those who are the most vulnerable and the most needy within our family. So what does this look like at Covenant? How does this passage impact 
who we are and what we do. I'm not going to name names because I don't want to embarrass them, but we have multiple families within our church who have lived out verse 4, who have shown by the way they've cared for parents, uh, their concern and recognizing their, their in need to return the investment uh, and have not left their parents in a, in a situation in which they're unable to cope, sometimes very sacrificially, because that's what we do as believers when we have that opportunity. We have deacons who are to be commended greatly for their care for widows within our congregation, who contact our widows to see, are, are you doing okay? Do you have particular needs that we can help you with to show the love of the church and, and the love of Christ to, to these dear women? Uh, deacons who, who uh, provide uh, opportunity, make arrangements for rides for, for widows that can no longer drive. Uh, deacons who, who provide uh, arrangements for, for others to come by a, a, a widow's home to help her with uh, maintenance and other issues that, that uh, they are unable to do themselves. We provide uh, funds to help uh, uh, widows with their prescriptions and with medical care and, and things like that, that that they are unable to provide for themselves. And we do this not as an obligation, not, not as some sort of burden we have, but we do this out of tremendous love because they're part of our family, because we love them. And God has given us this opportunity to care for them and support them in this way. This is one way a family loves and cares for one another. This is one way we show the impact of the gospel in our lives. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunities we have to love each other. We thank you for the, the dear folks that you've given to us, uh, who've experienced a loss, with whom we can help and support and show practical love. We thank you for our church members who come alongside their, their parents and other family members and make provision for them, who are living out the, the obligations of the gospel uh, in ways that are apparent and, and are clear, and for the examples that they set for us. Father, give to us that, that ongoing understanding of your great love for us as the basis for the great love we show to one another. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.